Yeah. You done broadcasting. Yeah, good. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. We are going to give it another three or four minutes and then we will, uh, we'll make a start. Good to see some familiar names making a return. So uh, thanks, thanks for joining. Thanks again for joining all. And um, any queries that you've got with audio, then you can just put it in the chat box. Put it in the yeah, put it in the chat box, and we'll do what we can to to help you get online. Chat box is at the bottom. Of your screen should be. I don't know if it matters, Angus, but I'm only seeing four people. Yeah, that's right. It's that's fine. on the panelists. Yeah. Thanks to those of the, the of you that are on. Um, we'll give it another couple of minutes, and then uh, and then we'll make a start. Thank you for joining. Thank you again to those that have joined. Mm. We'll give it another uh, one minute and then we'll, then we'll make a start. Okay, I think we're uh, I think we're ready to make a start. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, yet again, I think that we can speak for and on behalf of all the panelists that a year, the attendance and the registration for these webinars, these workshops, is uh, has been truly inspirational, and um, that really gives us the energy to keep doing them. And um, I think today is another workshop and now you won't be disappointed. So electrical safety authorization and training, we have with us today, speaker Ian uh, Burgess, 
and I think as you'd have seen in the communications that we put out there that we are looking at um, the qualifications and the requirements for work in electricity, looking at competency levels and uh, look also looking at training. So um, what are you training your people on? Um, what are they trained to know? When are they trained? How often are they trained? And um, Ian has got a lot to share with us. So just a few ground rules before we start, I guess, is that um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. And so again, within there, please put in any questions or supportive suggestions that you've got that may apply to the, the, the attendees that are on this workshop today. And um, the question and answer part we'll pick up at the end of this uh, at the end of this workshop. However, we are taking a bit of a new approach. So to ensure that we maintain the engagement of the audience, on your toolbar at the bottom, there should be a raise hand button. And the purpose of this is that throughout this session, it's going to be a bit of a tricky one from a, the managing of timings. But if there is a question that you have, which is pertinent, which is relevant to the particular topic that Ian has just spoken about or is talking about, maybe a point of clarification that you would like, then um, by all means, if you just click the raise hand button, it will feature next to your name on my attendees panel I have here. And it gives me the capability to unmute you. I can call your name out and you can speak. You can voice your question and Ian can answer it, you may say, live, on air, at the particular point of his presentation. Um, we're gonna see how it goes. Don't be shy, feel free to pitch in. I am concerned around timings. So um, if we start running behind time as a result of that, then we may just need to keep rolling. But um, anyway, let's keep moving. So uh, Ian, we can move on to the next slide. By way of introduction, my name is Angus Long. i am uh, been working within Scanware for the last 12 years. Many of you will be familiar with my attendance on these workshops. Um, why am I on them? Why do we do them? I'm a director here within the Scanware business. Our mission, our focus is saving lives. It's what we are all about. This session, again, is obviously totally non-commercial. No product, no organization, no brand is promoted. But we have with us today, Ian Burgess. We have had excellent panelist speakers on every single one of our workshops. This is number five. Um, but Ian is, uh, is a limited edition. I think uh, working within the industry, the electricity industry for the last 40 years, working within UK Power Networks, one of the UK's largest distribution network operators, working within Equinor as a control room manager, uh, latterly within UK Power Networks, a network manager, and also a fully qualified SAP, so a senior authorized person. But probably the biggest synergy between Ian Burgess and Scanware is a passion for electrical safety and saving lives. So with that, I'll stop talking and Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Angus. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, training and uh, authorization appointment. So just a quick look at what goes on around the world at the moment. Australia, you need to have approved and registered training organization that has to deliver a recognized and approved training and also a recognized qualification to go along with that training. In the US, training is required to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and they detail the training and quite often the National Fire Protection Association 70E is used. In Europe, EN 5110-1 is used, applicable uh, across the European community, and each country has its own appendix to deal with its specific needs. In the UK, we have the Health and Safety Work Act, the Management of the Health and Safety Work Regulations, and the Electricity Act Work Regulations, also EN 501101 for the UK with its appendices, but whether we'll have that moving forward. I don't know. So looking at the USA, if you do the NFPA 70E uh, course, it leads you to an appointment as a certified electrical safety compliance professional, which sounds really good. And but it's important to bear in mind that it's recognized that although you have this accreditation, it does not make you a certified person, a qualified person. 
it's responsible of the employer or the government agency to make that appointment. And employers in the US often use this certification as one of part of that requirement to be a qualified person. Now this is no different to the UK or EU. The appointment of making someone competent always rests with the employer, even if the training is provided by others. So we've seen that different countries have different legislation, regulations and standards. However, they have this common theme that training is required and some form of appointment or authorization is necessary. For the purpose of this webinar, I'm gonna look at a typical UK approach. The UK has some of the strongest and most stringent health and safety regulation in the world. But the UK also adopts what is called best practice. And we'll come on to that in a little bit. But different companies, all countries will have different requirements and these should be followed, although there should be nothing to prevent you doing more and adopting best practice. So the Health and Safety Work Act 74 under section two states that the employer must provide information, instruction, training and supervision and also a safe system of work. The management of the health and safety regs and the regulation seven that the employer must appoint one or more competent people to help them implement the measures needed. They should be a member of the workforce, the owner, manager, or you can use an external consultant such as myself, but it is clear that ideally they should work for the company full-time in a full-time role. That competent person should focus on the significant risks and those with serious consequences, and that time must be made available for them to do this work um, have regard to the size of the, the company, the risk involved, the number of employers and the location of those risks. Regulation 13 requires that every employer shall take into account their employees capabilities. Every employer shall ensure that employees are provided with adequate health and safety training and that training should be repeated periodically be adapted to take account of new, new or changed risks and take place during working hours. But it doesn't say what that should be and how appropriately it should be carried out or um, what the period for re repeating it is. The Trinity Work Regulations 89 under Regulation 16 say that no person should be engaged in any work activity where technical knowledge or experience is necessary to prevent danger or where appropriate injury, unless they possess such knowledge or experience or under such degree of supervision as maybe it's appropriate having regard to the nature of the work. The next line on here is Defence Regulation 29. We will come on to that. It's part of this part of the regulations, but we'll deal with that later on in the, in the webinar. But the whole object of this regulation is to ensure that people are not placed at risk due to their own lack of competence in dealing with electrical equipment or that of others. So competence, what is it? Well, it can be described as a combination of training, skills, experience and knowledge and their ability to undertake those responsibilities and perform activities in a recognised standard on a regular basis. But other factors such as attitude and physical ability also affect someone's competence. This competence is really important, whether it's employers, managers, supervisors, employees, and or contractors, especially those with socio critical roles, such as plant maintenance engineers, or in the areas that we're probably looking at here, authorized persons, and in particular, senior authorized person. So training, who decides what training? Often, as in the case of the UK, there is no legal document detailing the training required rather just that it is needed. The emphasis on what is required, how this is carried out and to what level is left to the employer. And this is called the duty holder in law in the UK. And it's up to the duty holder to decide what is necessary. And the picture in the background here that you can see is a substation which decided to explode one um, happy afternoon. Looks quite good. All the walls are intact, switch gears in a bit of a mess, but the walls are all intact. What you can't clearly see from here is the roof is missing. The door is blown out, but the roof has gone completely. And what you further can't see is 
the force of this explosion was massive and 25 feet away there are two bungalows. So training needs to have a consistent transparent approach. Ideally there should be documentation detailing the training required, the criteria for assessment and the assessment process. This should ensure that the training is consistent, open and transparent. Each competence and authorization, regardless of its group or category, should be worked towards in the same way and covered by the documentation. Other documentation should detail the periodic review, the assessment process, an investigation process if something, something should go wrong, and the removal of competence as that is deemed to be necessary and how that is done and why it is done. So the considerations for training. Candidates to be trained may range from those with a little or no electrical network knowledge, those with previous experience, those that have a rounded knowledge of the industry, and this could have been gained from working on other networks owned by other companies, and they could be authorised to do so via that company's competence and authorisation management process. The candidates nominated for training must have a willingness to progress, a methodical approach along with an understanding of the risks and additional responsibilities gained once the competence. And candidates must show an aptitude for complying with the safety rules and other procedures. You don't want somebody who will do their own thing if they find that what they want to do won't work. So training, there can be no one size fits all approach to training. Different people learn in different ways. Some will understand and retain information better than others. Some will pick it up from lectures, some will like to read it in the book, some like to see it as a film presentation. All of those are useful media to get your message across. You may have to change it for different people, it just depends what you're doing. But it needs to contain a mix of both theory and practical learning. There is no good talking about this is how a switch operates, this is how this does that, without showing and explaining. As they say, a picture points a thousand words. It can be particular challenges with high voltage energies involved however and quite often external contractors are used for this. So training and competence, what is it? I like the term skate and my little dog on his skateboard but the acronym here is quite good I think. The skills, the ability to carry out specific tasks involves both understanding and proficiency, the knowledge, theoretical or practical understanding, attitude, a willingness to follow rules and procedures, and not do their own thing. Training, taught through sustained practice and instruction. And experience, implementation of what you have learned gained over time. So how's it delivered? Well, two ways really, in-house training, theory and practical experience delivered by persons who have the relevant expertise, but just as important is the willingness and aptitude to train mentor. And then you can use external training providers. And they're often used by companies, particularly where high voltage operations are required or where the company is relatively small and doesn't have in-house experience. However, careful consideration should be taken before selecting a company for, to provide this training. Who do you want? The cheapest? You know, the accountant would. The quickest? The management team might. The most expensive? Maybe. The best pass rate? Do you want accredited training, seat in guilds? It's up to you, it's up to you. You're the person gonna do the appointment, you decide. So first aid and resuscitation training, do I need it? Well, the regulations say that an employer must make an assessment if he needs it. I think we would all agree in this industry that first aid training is really important to us. Electricity is a dangerous commodity doesn't give second chances and affects the nervous system. So in general, companies provide first aid and resuscitation training. They often provide defibrillator training as well. And this could easily be deemed as best practice in our industry to do so. So we have different competence levels in the UK. And they're used to identify the competence and authorization of candidates to be assessed against. So we start off with competent persons, generally a person recognised as having sufficient technical knowledge 
and or experience to enable him or her to avoid danger. But they may be additionally appointed to receive uh, clearly defined safety documents, usually something like a permit to work, limitation of access, limited work certificate. But in some countries, this is known as a designated competent person. We talk about competent persons and competence levels, and there can be several. So the competent person could be authorised just to enter a substation. They could be authorised to enter a substation where there are no exposed high voltage conductors or potentially low voltage conductors exposed. There are lots of sites that still have exposed low voltage conductors. They could be authorised to go into an area which contains high voltage conductors, bare conductors above your head, six or seven feet away. As said, they could be authorised to receive permit to work, limitations of access, limited work certificates. But they wouldn't generally be authorised to receive a sanction for test document. They may be deemed competent to uh, supervise the movement of ladders, and vehicles along objects in an area containing high voltage conductors. You don't just want anybody in an area such as that where you have high 33,000 up to 400,000 volt conductors just feet above your head. Um, we all know electricity can jump, so you would not want to be moving certain objects in there and not let anyone else do it. So competence levels, authorised people. Authorised persons category is often segregated into two distinct groups. These distinct, distinct groups relate to the operational duties and switching activities of field-based personnel, along with specific duties undertaken by a control engineer. So an authorised person is also a competent person, over 18 years of age, and been appointed by the employer to carry out specified duties, which may include authority to issue and cancel certain safety documents, usually limitations of access to limited work certificates. And then we have another role, the control engineer role, and they are an authorised person. And they're appointed in writing by the employer, or they could be an appropriate officer of another company. And they're responsible for the operational control and coordination of the system and for control and coordinating safety activities across defined boundaries. So this could be the boundary between your company and receiving it from National Grid or from the local DNO network. And they manage that. Where there is no central control engineer and lots of companies won't have one, this role is usually carried out by an SAP. So we come on to the next level and what most people would consider the senior level and that of the senior authorised person. And they again are appointed by the company in writing and they carry out certain specific duties, including the issue and cancellation of safety documents. It's used to recognise those persons that have the required technical knowledge combined with experience to carry out operational duties and safely manage work on or near high voltage electrical networks. There are some safety rules in the UK that don't have this role um, and that is, role is then undertaken by the authorised person or they have authorised persons who have a subcategory of being able to issue safety documents. So following training there will be a need to decide if, some, if a person has reached a certain level to be deemed competent. There can't be a standard assessment process for this. The needs of each competence vary and the knowledge required for appointment as a senior authorised person is quite different to that required for a competent person whose only requirement is to enter a substation. Ian? Yes. Hello, the, sorry, a question's um, just come in around SAPs and the, the, the gist of it really is, is that there seems to be a wide variation between qualifications and competency of SAPs. What would you say about that? I would agree with you. There is um, different SAPs in, around on the networks and being used in the UK. Um, the training that they receive to be appointed as an SAP varies considerably depending on where they come from. Um, I think you can say f f with some degree of um, accuracy that uh, 
DNO and National Grid SAPs get significant more training than other people do. It's their bread and butter business and they put more money into it. Um, but I have seen things online where people think I can go and do a week's course and that will make me a senior authorised person. It doesn't. You just don't have the experience that goes with the role. You can only gain that over time. If that answers the question. I think so. They can. Uh, it's good. I think it's helpful. Keep going. Okay. So the, the point of a person's to any category of competence can't be decided by the length of time which that person has been authorised at a different category or the duration of training and how much they've done or the fact that they were appointed by another company in that role. You shouldn't be looking at somebody and saying, John Smith was, all, was a senior authorised person with the ABC company, therefore he can do the role here. It's not the right way to approach competence. Suitability for assessment must be measured by the person's approach, their attitude, their knowledge, and their application of safety rules and operational procedures. Having said all that, previous experience, training and competencies and authorizations can to some extent reduce the amount of training needed. You need to look at each case on an individual basis. In some circumstances, persons with sufficient experience and previous knowledge might not require any further training. However, they will require familiarity and understanding of the safety rules and procedures which they'll be required to work to once appointed. For example, the terminology that you use and your procedures may be different to what they're used to. The way you lock things off and how those keys and safety locks are applied could be different. Um, and the new SAP or the new AP would need to understand all of that. So there are certain parts of the assessment that you should always do. The appointment of young persons. Surprisingly, electricity work regulations do not require a person to be over 18 to do work. They do put some restrictions in, but they don't stop it. But the Energy Networks Association does, and that has a minimum age requirement of 18 years before that person may be alone in a substation or hold any live working authorization, including people doing that work or adjacent to live apparatus. Now this could be defined as best practice in the UK because UK safety rules used by major companies meet this obligation. So all the DNOs and National Grid and some of the big wind farms will have the same regulation. So the assessment process. Competent person. The role of competent person is at the lower spectrum of competence with the right approach to training, which is often delivered as a PowerPoint presentation assessment we carried out using a multiple choice question paper. It's also not unusual to use a computer program for this, which shows you the information and then gives you a random selected um, number of questions to answer as a multiple choice on screen. But for some levels of competence, such as the receipt of safety documentation, a more formal assessment may be necessary. You could possibly do it via a computer program, but I don't think you can be a one-to-one -one um, assessment of this. It gives you the feel of how much they know and their understanding and their approach to it. We move up to the authorised person, which is a higher level, then this would normally consist of several parts, such as a written test paper, which could be open book, so that they can look the answers up. They know they're in there, but not quite sure where they are. Uh, you see a practical exercise, and then eventually the authorisation interview. The practical exercise element of an assessment is often carried out at a third party location. And they provide additional training as part of a structured course. And they also provide written feedback on the candidate for you afterwards. They will cover other parts apart from just the practical exercise. They will deal with switching, good switching practice, writing switching applications, applying safety locks, writing safety documents. But what they won't tell you on the feedback is whether they are competent to be appointed. They will just say that in their view, you can consider it. So the authorization interview, daunting process for many. When it's designed to further explore the candidate skills, the capabilities and underpinning knowledge. Topics covered will usually 
relate to the safety rules and other procedural documents and technical questions on topics appropriate to the competence being sought. To ensure impartiality whenever possible, all persons involved within the assessment process should not have been majorly involved with the candidate's training. A formal record of the questions and answers from the interview should be filed and retained with all other assessment documentation. You've got a few stories to tell on that, have you not, Ian? Yeah, I can do. Um, so what do we see? I have authorised, I did an authorisation interview for somebody who said to me, and the question we asked was, how would you put earth up onto a high voltage conductor uh, inside a compound where we have open bars? And the answer was, I've never done that before, which was quite an interesting statement on its own. And then we said, well, never mind, let's talk, talk it through. How would you do it? And the candidate knew about Earths and he knew that they had to be applied. But his answer to the question was, how would you apply them? I would put all three clamps onto the buzz bars up in the air. And then with them in place, I would connect them to the Earth mat of the substation. And that rung absolute alarm bells with me and the other interviewee because your basic knowledge of electricity should tell you that you would put your earths on first. If those conductors were still alive, as soon as you pick them off the ground, well, you're touching a live conductor. Frightening. And this person was actually been appointed as an SAP with another company. Needless to say, we didn't appoint. Thanks, Ian. It's helpful. So assessment and further experience. It must be remembered that once you get your appointment through, particularly with an SAP and an AP, that they need further experience. They don't know everything. Um, and they don't have extensive experience within the role. And this will affect the scope of the work that they can carry out. Particular care must be taken whilst they continue to extend their knowledge and experience. Now, I know this firsthand. This happened to me, true story probably 30 odd years ago now, 30 years ago. I was a young, keen, as young people normally are, enthusiastic and willing to help engineer. My second or third job on my own was to work on an 11,000 volt network, cable network underground with uh, multiple cables feeding into a substation that needed to have all its switch gear train, chain, changed. Sorry. Big job, but hey, I'm up for it. I could do this. They also decided to give me a trainee who was learning and was to do all the switching. Off we went, do the work, switched out the circuit, got it all done, got all the safety locks in place, established all our isolation. Next stage was put the earths on. Got the first two earths on, went to do the next one. Trainee went in. It all been switched out, we knew it was fine. He put the earth on, whatever time it was, 1026 for argument's sake, back in the car, off to the fourth and fifth sites. Call from the control engineer. Has anything happened? No. Are you sure? Yes. He's only switching. Yes. Did you do anything at 1026? Uh, yes. <laughs> Why? circuit stripped. It turned out that the earthing and the locking on the switch gear had been incorrectly applied. I didn't pick it up, the trainee didn't pick it up, and we actually earthed the live feeder. The circuit tripped, no one hurt, protection operated as it should, but a valuable lesson learnt for me and for others. Um, you can be too keen in this field if you're not careful. Investigation took place. I lost my authorization, as for the standard at the time, which should really be now. I attended an authorization interview or interview into the event. The outcome of that was the job was a complicated job, really a bit early in my training or in my, not in my training as such, but in my authorization period. If I was to do it, 
I should have someone I could call on straight away and be around to help me. And there is no way that I should have had a trainee with me because that would focus my um, work ethic in a different way. I'd be looking after them, making sure they're safe rather than maybe looking at the bigger picture. I got my authorization back and carried on. But it's a valuable learning process for me and one I've taken through life um, that I don't get pushed. I don't get rushed into it. I take my time. And I have to say that has saved me um, from some mistakes later on in life. But the best compliment I can have from that, from a very good friend of mine, when we were both control engineers and he did a switching error, was I should have been more like you. You refused to switch until you're ready. I just went in and did it and there was a mistake in the program and he had an error and that was his comment. Um, you just have to learn not to be pushed. Anyway, enough of me, moving on. Oh no, quite not. It's me again. Competence certificates. Competence certificates should clearly indicate the competencies of the person, the authorised person, the senior authorised person, the control engineer or the competent person. But it should also be issued to anyone that's in training. It is the only document they have to say that they're being trained and that they can operate in this training mode. The document should include the voltage, the plant and apparatus that can be worked on, the location, which may be site specific, named, or it could be multiple sites individually named. The term all locations isn't usually used, um, except by large companies such as DNO um, and possibly National Grid, but even they're inclined to do it just by site these days or an area. And people can be authorised at various levels and or voltages. The appointment may be further limited by equipment type or specific tasks such as within a wind turbine generator. So this is one of my early authorisation certificates. Um, they used to take them off us when we got our new ones but they sort of stopped that. But this one has no validity a period so technically it's probably valid now unless there's some other documentation. Not that I would even try most of that on there anymore, but uh, there we go. So competence certificates. Two copies of certificates should be issued. And they're signed and dated by the authorising engineer, the recipient also signing and dating both copies. One copy should be kept by the recipient, ideally with the personally issued safety rules, and the duplicate copy should be retained by the authorising engineer or an appropriate person of the employer. They ought to have a validation period as well. Um, this varies normally between two to three years. Some companies use five, but as I said earlier, there is no laid down period. You don't have to if you don't want to. Um, it just, the law just says training needs to be carried out at certain times, but if you don't use your competency certificate, then you don't keep your skill set up to date. So it's good to have this. So competence re-evaluation should really be carried out periodically um, and decide whether that person still needs it. Certainly when I came from being an SAP uh, and went into our control room function, the company I worked for at the time, my SAP uh, ticket as we called it or my authorization was taken away from me as it was felt I didn't need to do it anymore. That did change over years and they came back to us but that was just the way it worked. And if they're not being used, they may need to be rescinded or they may need to be withdrawn in the case of an incident. So how do I manage this competency? Well, for competent people, it's fairly easy because it's at a lower level. They're just going on site and top up training or doing the same training again uh, would suffice for this. But for authorizations of authorized and senior authorized people, then it's a good idea to keep a portfolio switching log. It's just, this is just a simple one, piece of paper, and it has the date, the location, the competence of what you did, switching out a circuit or issuing a safety document, and a reference of the work release, the switching program that can be referred to and looked back later. And this gives you a history of what they've been doing and are they keeping their competency up to date? Are they actually using it? It'd also be a good idea to do some auditing. So, uh, selection of completed safety documentation should be audited, ensure that it's being written and produced and dealt with as per your safety rules and procedures. 
and then site inspections should be carried out to ensure compliance particularly at locations away from where you would normally work you would be looking for things like uh, correct locks applied the correct danger caution notices applied are they put in the right places um, is a document issued on site correctly are they doing the right process all your records are ought to be kept so the, all your training records such as those carried out in-house external courses attended qualifications and manufacturers courses should be kept and records kept but also authorization interviews and assessments audits um, and competence for evaluation should all be kept and stored for a period of time it's not set down but a lot of companies save them for seven years um, and some companies save them for seven years after they leave their employment as well well that is all all far too much work i aren't going to do that i know i'll employ a contractor hey happy days not my job anymore down the road walk in the However, park then <laughs> pardon it becomes a walk in the park then oh yeah should do shouldn't it you'd think so however the health and safety work act requires that when a contractor is used to carry out work that both parties are responsible for ensuring good standards of health and safety so if you use a contractor and lots of people do do you review their working methods and procedures in our field do you look at their safety rules do you look at their safety documents do they comply with uk legislation what about the competence of the staff i've certainly reviewed safety rules and i'll talk about that in the next slide but do i review the competence of their staff not to any great detail if i'm honest uh, a chat on site make sure i'm comfortable with what they are and is probably as far as it goes but who carries out this review for the company do they have sufficient knowledge and experience if things should go wrong both you and the contractor will come under the scrutiny of the hse you cannot get rid of your responsibility by appointing a contractor as much as you might like to so you come back to the electricity work regulations and regulation 29 defense that I mentioned earlier on in this presentation and that clearly is a defense and it says an offense consisting of contribution regulations 4 5 8 9 10 etc it can be a defense for any person to prove that he took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid the commission of that offense so what does that mean well, if something goes wrong and someone gets hurt the worst does happen um, you're likely to be investigated by the hsc so what will they look for well they will want to know did training take place were they competent and how are you going to justify that if you've kept records if you keep training accounts if you keep audits if you keep uh, conversations and things that I had to assess competency that is all good information to say you took reasonable steps something going wrong and the hsc is saying right you put this person to work you allow them to operate on your system how did you decide that and you say well they work for joe smith down the road so i thought it would be all right it's not really going to be a defense that you carried out reasonable steps and carried out due diligence so I know everything we talked about is a pain and it's cumbersome, but at the end of the day, it could save you and it could save the company. And the HSC have, in the last few years, taken an approach to prosecute individuals as well as the company. And there are lots of um, records of that. Um, one that springs to mind at the moment is the guy in the Midlands who used, ran a building business and they were replacing some work on an asbestos roof and they were cutting the asbestos using a disc cutter. The people in the building noticed it, they were getting some dust into the building. They contacted the HSC, the HSC put a prohibition notice on them and stopped the work. The owner of the business 
was called to account by HSC to attend site and, and or attend court, I should say. He failed to turn up. He failed to turn up twice. And the third time he turned up, he got a fine and he got 14 days imprisonment. Now bear in mind, no one was hurt, no one was injured. He still got 14 days imprisonment. Another case, a company that I know before the rules changed for an incident where someone was killed and they were fined a million pounds was the company fine. And that occurred just before the HSC changed the way they find businesses. Had it been a couple of months later, estimates are it would have been in the range of five to six million. The HSC now look at global profits from the company involved. Uh, the thought process being that they want to hit the company hard and the way they hit it is to hit profits because shareholders don't like profits going down. So review a contract to documentation and appointments. I've done a few. I have looked at documentation in the UK. I've looked at it in Ireland. I've looked at um, documentation from the States to be used in the UK so that a company can use their rules on our network. I've looked at rules in South Africa and Brazil and also in Europe. And these are a few things that I have found um, in recent audits of safety rules. Now bear in mind these are companies that do this day in day out. They have their own safety rules in their company's name um, and they work as contractors for others. So I just got asked to give them the once over. So we found the following. The use of a common master key to establish isolation, i.e. lock out, tag out, which is a clear breach of UK electricity it work regulations where all points of isolation must be secured. And if you look at the guidance that's given by HSC, they actually use the word safety key. The problem with the master key is that it can be moved by anyone with such a key and they're common. So the safety rules themselves had no safety distances defined in them, although they were HV rules. They didn't say how close you could get to live conductors. safety rules which allowed a high voltage network to be energized whilst the safety document was out on the high voltage network and would require lock out and tag out to be maintained to keep it safe but the rules allowed you to energize it with someone working practically um, no provision on how to work live li live on low voltage equipment um, except a two-page document which when reviewed there's nothing to do with live, live working and it was all to do with the lockout and tag out procedure. And then the reference to a limited work certificate throughout the safety rules. That's a document that the company didn't use. So there we go. A few examples. Well, time seems to be pushing on. Luckily, we've come to the end. So any questions? Good on you, Ian. That's excellent. The um questions come through is to how do you see qualification versus experience some of the workers do not have formal electrical qualification but they are aware about the job the risk associated with it can you recommend that workers as as a authorized person or competent person based assessment i think i can get that <laughs> As an authorising engineer, competency was something I was very happy to do. Um, and I'd be very happy to do my own training for that and my own assessment because that's fairly straightforward. I'm actually quite happy to do high voltage as well. But I think it's always better to put someone on an accredited course, um, which leads to a qualification. Um, I, I particularly like the City and Guilds high voltage switching and high voltage safety courses. There are a few others around now, which lead to a recognized City and Guilds qualification. I like them because it means someone else has looked at the training and has carried out some work with those people and they make a recommendation and they're not afraid to say, we don't think they're ready. And I think that we talked about the defense regulations a bit earlier on that 
if you have this third party assessment to a course which is run by an accredited body, i.e. sit in guilds that they monitor and they have set and it's to a set standard, that gives you just another piece of information to say, I did due diligence, I tried to do my best, if that answers the question. That's good, thank you Ian. Another question is around the control of switching operations with senior management having expectation that mechanical engineers have the ability to switch an LV network the same as their electrical engineers. Not too sure what the question quite right. <laughs> I think I know what they're saying. Um, I think that's an easy thing for management to say and, and to want, but is it practicable? I, my view would be there will be mechanical engineers that can handle this and there will be mechanical engineers who can't but you won't know that unless you do the training and you should do the assessment if if, if management um think you have it are they going to put put it in writing that you can do it um, and if you're not happy you should raise it and flag it up through whatever process your company has that's good another question from gordon here any concerns around icps operating on dno networks not all will have the necessary experience <laughs> Um, that question was, has been raised from the time that I worked for a DNO um, and where do you go? And yes, it's a risk, but it's a risk that doesn't just rest with DNOs. It rests with any company who employs a contractor. Um, I, I accept in the case of the DNO network that the ICP doesn't actually need their consent in the same way, but I, I don't see what can be done about it at the moment. Um, and I'm a little out of touch with the DNO ICP context at the moment, I'm afraid. So I see it as a risk, um, but I also see that, at least in my opinion, and I'm probably an old fart now, to be honest, at my age, that um, the standards of training, I think, have dropped over the years. Um, I'm sure everyone says that, and I'm sure that everyone says the standard of um, education and the quality what you need to get your uh, degree is much lower than it used to be 20 years ago and it goes along with all the poli policemen are much younger than i remember but i think that goes with getting older in life but i think there is some truth in the drive down of the skill base within the industry good so that's very much a personal opinion it's good there's another question here that's been raised by um in one moment by Zamil. One moment. I was hoping I could unmute him for, for him to be able to ask his question. So the question's come in, why is an AP authorized to issue an LOA, but not an SFT or a PTW? Right, okay, so talking about LOAs, limitation of access and limited work certificates. It's been common in the DNO business that certain authorised persons can issue those two documents. Um, but the sanction for test and the permit to work have always rested with the senior authorised person. Now, that is the case if you look at DNO networks and national grid. Um, not all APs can issue safety documents. And it probably goes back historically to the early 30s and 40s, I would think, where we had blue collar and white collar workers. Um, you'll, you'll find now that some DNOs actually have um, authorized people that can issue safety documents. Um, they're quite often called limited authorized people or limited senior authorized people and can only, only do certain things. But that is where it runs from predominantly. Um, but there are some rules that do allow authorised people, because they don't have SAPs, to issue permits and sanctions. Should we remember though, with a sanction for test, that you are likely to be taking earths off. So you do need a bit more knowledge than basic. And also you could well be putting high voltages down those cables and then having people come and work on the network. Um, you're into putting earths back on discharging cables to get rid of uh, any charge that might be present from your testing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian. We have another question here, which is regards to SAP certification. 
um, having its validity as per the UK laws. Um, well, U UK law only doesn't actually say that. All it says is that training should be um, carried out at some time. It doesn't say what the legal term is. It doesn't say how long it's valid for. Uh, it's all left to the duty holder under UK health and safety law. Okay. I think the end we need to uh, we need to keep rolling so really appreciate the questions have come in any that remain unanswered we're going to feed back um, in writing a recording will be made of the uh, of the webinar um, but if you just move on one slide I think that uh, we are going to be running so September the 9th which is in two weeks time we are going to be running an electrical safety and compliance workshop dedicated to the wind energy sector so we're going to be having uh, David Armour who is a uh, uh, HCQ director for natural power and also he chairs the safety on onshore wind energy turbine uh, uh, technical advisory committee also Amir Shahzad, Shahzad MHI Vestas the electrical safety authority um, and then we also have representatives of EDF renewables and SSE renewables September the 17th again we have electrical safety standards and legislation again all free to attend and once the training has been approved as per the previous sessions that there have been there will be a CPD certification notification issued. Um, I uh, think also to really clarify, we're going to be promoting the following workshops. I think the humble um, recognition that I should have given at the start of this session is certainly for UK attendees that we've now had two fatalities within the utility industry in the last two weeks. I'm 35 myself. I think two weeks ago, there was a 30 year old. And then last week there was a 32 year old. So um, deeply, deeply sobered and our condolences and uh, thoughts would go out to uh, the families and the colleagues of those affected. And um, so I think with that, we can close up the session. And I again, thank each and every attendee for the time taken to attend today. And um, if there are any questions that you would like to see on forthcoming workshops, then please do share them with us. If you yourself feel that you have a knowledge to share, then please speak with us and we would warmly welcome um, panelists, guest speakers to join the community with the one single focus of saving lives. So um, thank you all and I wish you a good morning, a good afternoon and a Sorry. good evening. Just as a reminder, Angus, if everyone could fill in the questionnaire, um, it should be open on your web browser tab. Um, there'll be a quick questionnaire to fill in if you can keep filling that in. Um, it helps us make these more beneficial for the audiences. And uh, we'd be very glad to hear what you think. Thanks Thank for that. You. By all means, uh, I'm, let me just see if Zamil's on. So there's one more question to come through. Zamil still is on. He said these, one more quick question that's come through in quickly is, um, when you, this is you, Ian, briefly lost your authorization, you mentioned it was because a live conductor was earth. Is that correct? Yes. And the question is, so I'm assuming the breaker needs to be opened, isolated, the point of isolation recorded, and then earthed. Yeah, that is the way you would normally do it. Um, I've not gone into that in this, in this presentation, but yes, you would uh, identify it, isolate it, lock it off, and then you would put your earths on. What happened to me and the way it was done was that on the switch gear, the um, labeling wasn't as good as it could have been. And the trainee that I had with me, um, and that should have been better, we actually put the lock through and the lock that was used obscured part of the indication of the switch gear to take it to the next stage. So in some ways, it fell into a trap that we'd established all the correct isolation so all the live parts were now switched away from the area that we wanted so when we put the earths on we would only be switching onto dead network but because of this mix up of the way the locking had been done by a previous uh, person we ended up actually earthing a live feeder um, thank you ian and thank you zamil for the engagement thanks for the questions if it's open, can I do one more from David? Um, yeah, good, Davenport. David Davenport, yep. 
Yep, and he raised the question, news this week of another three electrocutions to LV electricians in the UK. I have to say I only know of one, but which was that fatality you mentioned, which is really sad, and I think it is a grave concern that it's, you know, people that are being injured, but then I have to say they do a lot of live work as well. And the question is, do you think there should be more done by accreditation bodies on HSC to ensure all are more aware of the points made? Well, I fail to understand really why we don't have a nationally recognized qualification network now. You have the Corgi system for gas. Why haven't we got something similar for electricity? Why don't we have a credit your trainers where you can basically accept that if they've been trained to one level by one company, it would be accepted by all others. Um, I've never seen it. I, I don't believe it'll come in my lifetime. The closest that I have seen it be is that when I worked for the DNO and during big storms or following a big storm, that I went from my home network to a network in the Midlands and they took the appointment and authorization that my company had given me as uh, an authorization to work on their network. And they gave me a ticket appropriately to do so. Um, in fact, they actually gave me more authorizations than I actually had with the company that I worked for, and I refused to take them. <laughs> but I, th I think there ought to be a national scheme of some sort. How you're going to do it, I have no idea. Very good. Thank you, Ian. Thanks for the question, David. So I, I think, think David with that, we, okay, I think we can uh, keep moving on. So thank you all. We're going to uh, leave the workshop now and keep safe. And we look forward to having you back on the uh, either the 9th or the 17th of September. And um, what I would say is spread the word. And so when you receive an invitation through to another uh, workshop, if there's someone else within your organization, friend or colleague who's working on or near live or potentially live electricity or is responsible for people working as such, then, um, then why not spread the word? Thank you. And, uh, we will close the uh, we'll close the workshop down. Thank you all. Is Angus closed, or do you need me to? Um, it's you, Ian. Bottom right. right. I'll stop share. Right, has that done it? Hello?